Hi, good afternoon and thank you for uh, attending our seminar this, today. Um, the Technology in Later Life project derived back in uh, the spring of 2015 and for a number of reasons I will come on to shortly. This is, just gives you a brief overview of uh, my presentation today and as we're all aware uh, ageing is a very big problem and is based on estimated statistics it's going to uh, increase more so over the decades to come. From a Northern Ireland perspective you can see from the statistics um, that population over 85, 90 and the centenarians has increased and will increase um, and the technology in later life per primarily focused on the technology use and perceptions behaviour of adults age 70 and over. So why look at the impact of ICTs um, by adults in, across four sites in two countries. Basically, it was to look at how older, older adults um, use IT, ICT to reduce um, their social isolation, increase intergenerational relationships, peer, uh, communication with peers, access to services, um, but also to ascertain what needs and requirements that they may want. What I've also noticed over the last few years, the literature in the gerontology, social sciences and the human computer interaction fields, basically they do recruit adults over 70 or over 80, but it is very limited and it's not necessarily reported in a robust manner um, based on the results that they find. They always say, you know, high ad low adherence, high dropout rate. And this is another reason why TIL... Um, was formed to kind of understand what are the needs and requirements of adults aged 17 and over. So the two countries and four study sites, this was based on my colleagues in Swansea University, the University of Regina and the University of Northern British Columbia. And we all have different expertise, knowledge in the fields of gerontology, social sciences and leisure and based on our own experiences, knowledge and expertise, we came together to, to, uh, to execute TIL, excuse me. Because TIL is an exploratory study, we wanted a small sample, approximately 10 per site, which in theory, using a multi-methods um, approach, we would be able to conduct at least two focus groups. Um, the problem with Regina, um, as you can see, only six people were recruited. That was down to the ethical um, regulations of the university. And based on those regulations, the, my colleagues at Regina were only able to um, advertise the focus groups through posters rather than maybe direct approach what I was able to do with Age UK Milton Keynes site. Here is a, the overall sample for both rural and urban um, participants. We've got the mean age, the age range, and as you can see across the different sites, there were more younger people in South Wales as opposed to uh, McBride or Milton Keynes. There was more females than males. Um, one of the uh, limitations of this study is the majority of our participants were healthy as opposed to uh, maybe those who had chronic health conditions. Um, and future work would look at uh, a wider population in that sense. Learning ICT in later life, we all learn. We all learn from friends, family, um, our work colleagues. And as you can see from this slide, our <coughs> participants primarily learn from a friend. In our fo focus groups, this kind of varied. This could have been within the home um, or in social environments or clubs. From our focus groups, we um, ascertained a variety of positive positive and negative themes based on the perceptions of um, the impacts of ICT on their own lives. And that was one of our main things. It was, what do they want? 
And as you can see from across the 12 different themes, some of them overlap without doubt. And as uh, Professor Menocha has noted already, um, health, wearables, active and healthy ageing, um, these are key areas, not just from physical activity, but also you know, maintaining contact with friends and family, friends, family who may live across the country and you don't get to see regular. I'd like to um, give you some examples. These are direct quotes from our focus groups. Um, and first is a positive perceptions. Can you see at the back? Okay. Um, and what these quotes just gives you a flavour of what, has, uh, what our participants actually um, think and see. And as you can see, some people like the idea of using a Fitbit, um, although they do have mobility problems, they still perceive the use of a Fitbit as being um, some indication of how, act how active they are. Whereas um, participant two in example two in McBride, this, uh, this person talks about how they've, got, they've just had some um, fast internet brought in. Although she recognises and does say, you know, it's not like the fastest, but for what she previously um, was used to, it's fast for her. And in some of the other examples, some participants said they would drive from McBride, you know, three, four, five hours into the city and also check their, um, their, in, their email and do other internet searches because the internet was so slow out in McBride. From a negative perspe uh, perspective, um, this is based on the national health, um, and I know in the Milton Keynes survey, one gentleman did talk about how his mother, who's in her 90s, um, was in a way being forced to use the internet to make appointments, etc. And he said, you know, she doesn't have the internet. And this is another example down in Wales whereby the use of internet seems to be being pushed by GPs and other people. Also with the pressure and apprehension of using technology, uh, which isn't on here, our participants, certainly in the rural communities, noted that their children and grandchildren kind of pressured their grandparents or parents to use um, a mobile phone if they were traveling long distance, just for as means of safety. Um, whereas in the urban, that wasn't necessarily the, the case. Negative perceptions um, in regards to privacy and sharing of information via technology. Um, in a couple of slides later on, I'll show you some minor differences. But for some participants, they were very much aware that social media, um, wearable use, there was privacy issues. <coughs> And for them, um, that made them decide whether they should continue using social media, even though it was a means of communicating with friends and family. For some, it, it was just it was a non-starter. And I think with the social media uh, reliability of accuracy of wearables, um, these are additional elements that need to be addressed in future research. So what are the difference between rural and urban from the standpoint of the te technology in later life project? As you can see from the slide, rural participants, they were 30% more likely to use a PC as opposed to the urban. Um, rural more likely to use social networking sites, again for children, grandchildren keeping in touch with them, sharing photos. And generally, um, Skype communication was one of the primary tools as well. From an urban standpoint, majority used a PC for email communication, not necessarily for social media, although some did report social media. Those at the Milton Keynes site, um, they were more active in community um, groups as opposed to social media. Instant messaging was also reported by one of the Milton Keynes participants and she said, I don't use so social media, I don't see the point, it's a waste of my time, I have better things to do in my time. 
but she did communicate via instant messenger, WhatsApp. And she says, if I want to see, speak to my children, or we share photos, that's how we do it. So what about future work? This is, um, th this is uh, an area that is growing considerably year by year. Um, and from the standpoint of the technology in later life, not just from a UK perspective, but also international, there is certainly um, room for this work to be more honed and expanded upon, including more counties, provinces, and more countries. Increased participant numbers, that is a limitation of this exploratory study, but I would like to think that the TIL gives a flavour of culture from different um, adults in different geographic locations and something that from a UK standpoint we could learn from and build upon. Within the TIL project, um, all participants were asked to complete an online Google Docs survey comprising of 80 items across several domains, computer use, um, internet service providers, social media, health, demographic information, privacy issues, purchasing habits. And in the future, what I would intend to do is to get this survey validated, as well as translated, if needs be, if we had other countries involved, and get that validated as well. Longitudinal data sets. We all read policy documents, publications, books, and there's no, we, we, we get data from everywhere and the stats can say one thing one year and something different the next. And what would be great is to have a longitudinal data set, which is something that I plan within my research agenda, as well as working with colleagues and policy makers um, to log maybe every couple of years or so, three years, to look at the patterns. What patterns are changing? Why are they changing? Is it because regulation of privacy? Are people who are younger, the baby boomer generation, are they more open as opposed to the 70, 80 year olds of sharing information on social media? Or do they actually just share on WhatsApp? Or do they choose not to? I think this kind of longitudinal data set would be um, important for, for preparation for future aging generations, the Gen X and the millennials. And it, although we're focusing on older adults, the younger generations also need to be starting to look at as well. Identify the needs and requirements. We all have different learning needs. Um, health literacy, digital health literacy is important, not just from an older person standpoint, but a younger person standpoint. And identifying the needs and requirements Ha, it is, is a challenge in itself and I feel and believe that by ascertaining and working with um, policy makers, stakeholders, community groups, we would be able to identify what needs and requirements, although you know, it's, it's a long-term study basically, long-term project. And to monitor change over time, in the last 18 years, two decades, Technology, the software has, is phenomenal. Um, and I sometimes catch myself thinking, what would I do without a mobile phone now? How, you know, how would I communicate with friends to tell them that I was going to be late? And I always think, you know, what, what will be over the next 20 years, the next 30 years, and what needs and requirements for younger people, the Gen X and the millennials, how will they evolve with technology? And will different needs and requirements, different approaches to learning, will, will they need something different? So just a couple of conclusions. Older adults, or 17 over, do use technology. They use it for a variety of different reasons. We know that through our friends, family, peers. Um, there are challenges. We, we know there's challenges. But trying to... Um, Get evolved, trying to deal with these challenges and learn from those who are actually using 
and listening to them I think is very crucial to moving this work forward and potentially changing maybe manufacturers viewpoints for example the Fitbit you try and open a Fitbit packaging it's very difficult with some mobile phones now there's no instructions if an older person was to get a smartphone they and they've never used one they would be asking their children or grandchildren some policy recommendations um, from the TIL study, um, which I hope um, you'll find very useful from today's presentation. Focus on the strengths and opportunities that ICT can bring for adults over 17 over, as well as younger generations. And not only that, but the intergenerational relationship. Because I think sometimes Although younger people, I know with my own parents, I get asked questions and I quickly show them and then I get asked again, can you please do it slowly? It's a learning process, but I feel that the, the younger people can provide older adults with this um, instant um, feedback for them. Training and education opportunities uh, and peer, re peer support. We all vary with different terminology um, and jargon. And I think if, if an older person, say, in a library class environment whereby there's a computer club running and it's maybe twice a week for an hour, two hours, it allows um, the respective people to, to show and demonstrate how a piece of technology can, can be used if they have a problem or how, the, how to use the internet or email. To engage with different age co cohorts to ascertain the impacts of ICT and technology use, behaviour and perception for future ageing populations. What I might perceive um, as positive or negative could be very different to my peers, could be different to younger generations as well as older generations. And I feel that by learning from our current older generations has um, the possibility of showing or preparing us for the future as opposed to a knee-jerk reaction in 20, 30 years' time. Explore how intergenerational relationships work. Um, myself and colleagues, we currently have a paper under rev review and I would be happy to share that paper in the future with you if you request. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm open to questions and I look forward to speaking with you afterwards. Thank you.